the tapeworm is in. What do you want to do, my friends? Go out? Go out where? Go out to the discotheque? No, go to a restaurant, to the House of Butterfly. The House of Butterfly? Is that a pleasant restaurant? It is not expensive, if that is what you mean. Oh, good. The matter is settled. Let us all proceed to the House of Butterfly. Before leaving New York, I enrolled in a month-long French class taught by a beautiful young Parisian woman who had us memorize a series of dialogues from an audio cassette that accompanied our textbook. Because it was a beginning course, the characters on our tape generally steered clear of slang and controversy. Avoiding both the past and the future, they embraced the moment with the stoicism common to Buddhists and recently recovered alcoholics. Fabian, Carmen, and Eric spent a great deal of time in outdoor restaurants, discussing their love of life and enjoying colas served without ice. Passing acquaintances were introduced at regular intervals, and it was often noted that the sky was blue. Taken one by one, the nouns and verbs were within my grasp, but due to drug use and a close working relationship with chemical solvents, it's all I can do to recite my zip code, let alone an entire conversation devoted to the pleasure of direct sunlight. Hoping it might help with my memorization assignments, I broke down and bought a Walkman, which surprised me. I'd always ranked them between bow constrictors and Planet Hollywood t-shirts in terms of vulgar accessories, but once I stuck the headphones in my ears, I found I kind of liked it. The good news is that, as with a bow constrictor or a Planet Hollywood t-shirt, normal people tend to keep their distance when you're wearing a Walkman. The outside world suddenly becomes as private as you want it to be. It's like being deaf but with none of the disadvantages. Left alone and forced to guess what everyone was screaming about, I found that walking through New York became a real pleasure. Crossing 14th Street, an unmedicated psychotic would brandish a toilet brush, his mouth moving wordlessly, as in my head the young people of France requested a table with a view of the fountain. The tape made me eager for our move to Paris, where if nothing else I'd be able to rattle from memory such phrases as, let me give you my telephone number and I, too, love the sandwich. As it turns out, I have not had the occasion to use either of these sentences. Though I could invite someone to call me, the only number I know by heart is Eric's, the young man on my French tape. My brain is big enough to hold only one ten-digit number, and since his was there first, I have no idea how anyone might go about calling me. I guess I could stick with the line about the sandwich, but it hardly qualifies as newsworthy. Part of the problem is that I have no one to talk to, except for the members of my current French class, who mean well, but exhaust me with their enthusiasm. As young and optimistic as the characters on my cassette tape, they'll occasionally invite me to join them for an after-school get-together at a nearby cafe. I tried it a few times, but surrounded by their fresh and smiling faces, I couldn't help but feel I'd been wrongly cast in an international Pepsi commercial. I'm just too old and worn out to share their excitement over such innocent pleasures as a boat ride down the Seine or a potluck picnic at the base of the Eiffel Tower. It would have been good for me to get out, but when the time came, I just couldn't bring myself to attend. Neither can I manage to talk with the many strangers who automatically seek me out whenever they need a cigarette or directions to the nearest metro station. My present French class involves no dialogue memorization, but still I find myself wearing the Walkman, mainly as a form of protection. No great collector of music, I started off my life in Paris by listening to American books on tape. I'd never been a big fan of the medium, but welcomed them as an opportunity to bone up on my English. Often these were books I would never have sat down and read. Still, though, even when they were dull, I enjoyed the disconcerting combination of French life and English narration. Here was Paris, wrongly dubbed for my listening pleasure. The Grand Department Store felt significantly less intimidating when listening to Dolly, My Life, and Other Unfinished Business, a memoir in which the busty author describes a childhood spent picking ticks out of her grandmother's scalp. 
Seated by the playground in the Luxembourg Gardens, I listened to Lolita, abridged with James Mason and unabridged with Jeremy Irons. There were, I noticed, half a dozen other pasty middle-aged men who liked to gather around the monkey bars, and together we formed a small but decidedly creepy community. Merle Haggard's My House of Memories, The Autobiography of Martin Luther King, Treasure Island, if a person who constantly reads is labeled a bookworm, then I was quickly becoming what might be called a tapeworm. The trouble was that I'd moved to Paris completely unprepared for my new pastime. The few tapes I owned had all been given to me at one point or another and thrown into my suitcase at the last minute. There were only so many times a grown man can listen to the wind in the willows, so I was eventually forced to consider the many French tapes given as subtle hints by our neighbors back in Normandy. I tried listening to the misanthrope and Fontaine's fables, but they were just too dense for me. I'm much too lazy to make that sort of an effort. Besides, if I wanted to hear people speaking wall-to-wall -wall French, all I had to do was remove my headphones and participate in what is known as real life, a concept as uninviting as a shampoo cocktail. Desperate for material, I was on the verge of listening to my own books on tape when my sister Amy sent me a package containing several cans of clams, a sack of grits, an audio walking tour of Paris, and my very own copy of Pocket Medical French, a palm-sized phrase book and corresponding cassette designed for doctors and nurses unfamiliar with the language. The walking tour guides went through the city's various landmarks, reciting bits of information the listener might find enlightening. I learned, for example, that in the late 1500s my little neighborhood square was a popular spot for burning people alive. Now lined with a row of small shops, the tradition continues, though in a figurative rather than literal sense. I followed my walking tour to Notre Dame, where, bored with a lecture on the history of the flying buttress, I switched tapes and came to see Paris through the jaundiced eyes of the pocket medical guide. Spoken in English and then repeated slowly and without emotion in French, the phrases are short enough that I was quickly able to learn such sparkling conversational icebreakers as Remove your dentures and all of your jewelry and You now need to deliver the afterbirth. Though I have yet to use any of my new commands and questions, I find that in learning them, I am finally able to imagine myself Walkman-free and plunging headfirst into an active and rewarding social life. That's me at the glittering party, refilling my champagne glass and turning to ask my host if he's noticed any unusual discharge. We need to start an IV, I'll say to the Countess while boarding her yacht. But first, could I trouble you for a stool sample? With practice, I will eventually realize my goal. In the meantime, come to Paris and you will find me, headphones plugged tight in my external audio metis, walking the quays and whispering, has anything else been inserted into your anus? Has anything else been inserted into your anus?